Bonjour à tous, chers alumni. Je suis Leila Auger, directrice de l'EPF à l'alumni. Et c'est un plaisir de vous accueillir aujourd'hui pour notre conférence en ligne l'EPFL face au Covid. L'année dernière, à cette même période, nous étions dans l'insouciance la plus complète, plongés dans les dernières festivités du 50e anniversaire de l'EPFL. Personne n'aurait pu prédire un tel revirement de situation. En quelques mois, le Covid-19 s'est imposé et a transformé nos vies, et ceci à l'échelle planétaire, faisant place à une crise sanitaire et économique d'envergure. Alors que nous subissons la deuxième vague en Europe et que plusieurs vaccins sont en cours de validation et d'implémentation, de nombreuses questions restent en suspens. C'est dans ce contexte que nous, voulu, que nous avons souhaité réunir la communauté des alumni afin de faire le point sur ce sujet brûlant. Nous allons d'ailleurs d'abord accueillir, nous aurons d'ailleurs l'honneur d'accueillir notre président, Martin Vetterli, qui partagera avec vous comment notre alma mater, l'EPFL, a fait face à cette crise et quels impacts à court et à long terme cela aura sur nos missions d'éducation, de recherche et d'innovation. Nous avons également invité trois professeurs de l'EPFL très impliqués dans la crise Covid à venir partager leurs travaux et à participer à une table ronde animée par le directeur de la communication de l'EPFL, Mirko Bischofberger. Un temps de questions et réponses est également prévu en fin de webinaire et vous pouvez utiliser l'utilisation du bouton QR que vous avez en, en bas, en fait, sur vos écrans pour entrer vos questions et ou voter pour celles qui vous semblent les plus pertinentes. Nous prendrons les questions les plus plébiscitées en priorité et celles posées également en avance. Merci de noter donc euh, que la première partie de l'événement se tiendra en français et la deuxième partie en anglais. Alors, sans plus attendre, je vais donner la parole à notre président Martin Vetterli. Merci beaucoup Leïla. C'est un immense plaisir de participer à cet événement alumni online. Je pense que c'est un format qui est intéressant parce que on arrive à reach out to many more people uh, que dans un événement physique. Alors Leïla, uh, si j'ai bien compris, il faut que je parle en français. Uh, donc je veux bien me prêter à l'exercice. Vous me pardonnerez si je passe de temps en temps en anglais. Alors on a préparé quelques slides sur Living with the Virus comment vivre euh, en ces temps de pandémie. Si je peux avoir le prochain slide. Alors, merci beaucoup. Euh, donc, parlons un tout petit peu de la pandémie. Je ne vais pas passer trop de temps. Je pense que tout le monde est, euh, est obsédé par les nouvelles de la pandémie. J'espère que tout le monde euh, est resté sain et sauf durant cette période difficile pour tout le monde. Vous n'avez pas été... Vous n'avez pas été touché euh, directement. Alors, si on refait l'histoire, si on repasse le film, le début de la pandémie, le prochain slide, SVP, c'est évidemment euh, un médecin en Chine, à Wuhan, euh, qui commence à mettre sur les réseaux sociaux qu'il a un problème, qu'il a vu un problème euh, dans l'hôpital où il travaillait. Il a été accusé de tous les maux. Euh, on a essayé de le museler. Euh, mais c'est lui qui est à l'origine, en fait, de la prise de conscience. Malheureusement, il est décédé du Covid plus tard, en février, en, en ayant été réinfecté plusieurs fois. Euh, et puis, c'est là qu'on s'est rendu compte qu'il y avait un problème. On s'est rendu compte aussi que la transmission du virus, dont on entendra parler avec beaucoup plus de détails plus tard, prochain slide, euh, <coughs> se faisait d'abord... Par, euh, par les droplets, par les postillons. Donc, euh, euh, la proximité était un risque, mais pas seulement par les postillons, aussi par les aérosols. Et si on va un peu plus loin sur le prochain slide, on voit tout de suite que prendre des mesures toutes simples, comme par exemple prendre un masque, euh, mettre un masque euh, réduit la probabilité substantiellement dans les contacts humains. Et là, vous avez les exponentielles. Ce n'est pas des alumni de l'OPFL que je dois ex expliquer les exponentielles, mais je dois dire qu'on a essayé d'expliquer les exponentielles aux politiciens suisses et ça a été un peu plus sport. Euh, donc, une réaction un peu plus courte, parfois, euh, plus lente, parfois de la part de la politique. Euh, mais donc, des mesures très simples avaient un effet majeur, comme on l'a vu, par exemple, 
dans leur application dans certains pays. OK. Alors, le PFL, qu'est-ce qu'on a fait euh, pendant cette période de COVID Prochain slide, SVP. Euh, la, proche, la première chose qui est arrivée, si j'arrive à voir le prochain slide, c'est qu'on a eu un campus complètement vide. Alors, euh, vous qui êtes alumni de par le monde, vous n'avez pas l'habitude de voir ça, et je peux vous dire, ce n'est pas très drôle, c'est triste en fait. Mais donc, il y a eu un lockdown à partir du euh, 16 mars, pendant six semaines, avec très peu de gens sur le campus. Il y avait surtout les gens qui étaient impliqués dans la recherche sur le Covid, dont certains parlent tout à l'heure dans la table ronde. La timeline, prochain slide, euh, je ne vais pas entrer dans les détails, mais on a eu un lockdown, on a eu une réouverture partielle. Euh, ensuite, on a recommencé le semestre d'automne dans des conditions sanitaires difficiles. Finalement, on a dû arrêter les cours sur le campus. Euh, donc, tout ceci a été comme beaucoup d'autres campus universitaires. Il y a eu beaucoup de, de tumultes, de changements. Euh, d'informations euh, de dernière minute, etc. Mais plus ou moins, je pense, euh, mais ça c'est à d'autres de le dire, que le PFL a relativement bien managé dans une situation très difficile. Alors, remote work, I don't have to explain it to anybody. Uh, next slide, uh, si vous êtes sur uh, Zoom pendant 12 heures par jour, si ce n'est pas 15 c'est drôle, la première semaine, euh, mais je dois dire au bout de neuf mois, c'est un peu pénible. Mais voilà, c'est le new normal. Et puis, pendant cette période, next slide, on a quand même lancé une série de recherches spécifiques au COVID sur le campus. Et puis, des chercheurs impliqués vont en parler, donc je ne vais pas euh, leur souffler la priorité. Euh, on a des gens qui travaillent sur les, vac les vaccins. Prochain slide. Euh, par exemple, le professeur Correa, on a euh, le professeur Stellacci qui travaille sur euh, un potentiel médicament et on a bien sûr euh, Carmela Troncoso et ses coworkers qui ont travaillé sur Swiss Covid. Alors, Swiss Covid, vous en avez entendu parler. Si vous n'êtes pas en Suisse, euh, peut-être que ce n'est pas super utile. En Suisse, c'est super utile. Ça a aussi été un exercice. Euh, intéressant d'interagir avec les milieux politiques, euh, avec la presse, dans la communication, etc., mais aussi un, interagir avec l'administration en Suisse pour euh, essayer de, de faire adopter cette euh, application qui est vraiment « best of class in terms of privacy », donc il n'y a aucun souci de ce côté-là, mais d'un point, point de vue d'adoption, que ce soit par le large public ou par l'administration, c'était un peu plus fort. Je m'arrêterai là. Alors, en même temps, on a travaillé dans un certain nombre, next slide, de, euh, de task force en Suisse. Toute une série de nos professeurs étaient dans la task nationale qui conseillait le Conseil fédéral pendant la pandémie euh, et puis qui a fait un certain nombre d'autres projets aussi avec l'ETH de Zurich et d'autres membres de la communauté universitaire. Si je regarde l'effet sur le système suisse, euh, il est relativement simple. Next slide, next two slides actually. Euh, on a dû passer à une digitalisation très rapide. Ça, c'est les fameuses enveloppes jaunes de l'EPFL avec lesquelles on envoyait des factures, euh, des, des, euh, des décisions RH, etc. Et du jour au lendemain, on a quand même dû expliquer que la digitalisation avait finalement, était finalement arrivée à l'EPFL et qu'en fait, on ne pourrait plus faire ça. Euh, next slide, j'utilise l'habitude, let me do it this, uh, in English, uh, it's a meme on, on Twitter, right? Who led the digital transformation in your company? Is it the CEO? The CTO, the IT specialist, well, it is COVID-19 really realized the digitalization of the campus. Next slide. Um, et puis, prochain slide, s'il vous plaît. En même temps, on a dû essayer d'expliquer, uh, ça c'était un exercice intéressant, le grand public, uh, previous slide, please. Uh, we jumped, okay. Uh, voilà, merci beaucoup. On a dû expliquer qu'au grand public que ce que le public observait, c'était la science en marche. On n'avait pas les réponses, on découvrait un virus, on découvrait les transmissions possibles, on découvrait peut-être euh, des vaccins ou des médicaments. Les experts n'étaient pas toujours d'accord, mais finalement, c'est comme ça que fonctionne la science. Il y a, on, on doit proposer des solutions, à la fin, on doit 
euh, trouver quelle est la bonne solution. Et là, le public, évidemment, était un peu perturbé. Parce que d'un autre côté, les amateurs de fake news avaient des réponses très simples à ces questions très complexes. Et puis, ça nous a permis aussi, avec mon collègue Joël Mezot, euh, d'interagir pas mal avec les médias. Next slide. D'habitude, euh, j'essaie d'expliquer aux gens que quand on essaye d'améliorer le monde, euh, donc j'ai un current status et qu'on veut aller dans un improved status, D'habitude, entre ces deux points, il y a un col à passer, un sommet intermédiaire, et que c'est pour ça que, finally, we are stuck in a local optimum point, right? Et que chaque fois qu'on veut essayer de faire bouger le monde, eh bien, il faudra investir beaucoup d'énergie. En quelque sorte, COVID-19, cette pandémie, nous a permis de générer l'énergie nécessaire pour peut-être aller dans un endroit qui est meilleur, je l'espère. Mais ceci a été fait. Next slide, please. Euh, je dirais dans une triangulation complexe entre des intérêts de santé publique, on en parlera, des intérêts de l'économie, et ce, cette balance, cette pesée d'intérêts est très complexe, et finalement de démocratie. Comment est-ce qu'une démocratie relativement évoluée comme la Suisse, sur des questions de sphère privée, euh, de tracking par le gouvernement, etc., comment balancer ça avec les intérêts de l'économie tout en préservant au mieux la santé publique Cet exercice était difficile, on est encore en plein dedans, comme vous le savez, et d'habitude je finis le talk sur le Covid en disant « mais la vraie crise qui nous pend au nez, prochain slide, euh, tout le monde veut relancer l'économie, very good », donc, la barrière COVID-19 va peut-être se lever d'ici euh, quelques mois avec le vaccin et tout ça. Mais finalement, derrière cette économie qui veut avancer euh, euh, très rapidement, agressivement, etc., il y a un mur. Et le mur, bien sûr, c'est climate change, uh, global warming. Et faisons attention qu'on ne redémarre pas l'économie avec euh, les mauvaises intentions. Parce que la vraie crise, la crise à long terme, c'est la crise climatique. Voilà, c'est les quelques mots que je voulais dire en introduction. Merci beaucoup de votre attention et je passe la parole au speaker suivant. Voilà, merci beaucoup Martin pour votre partage et donc j'aimerais maintenant passer la parole à Wilnaus actually switch to English and ask Professor Fellet to join us on our virtual stage. So Professor Jacques Fellet is the medical scientist expert in the fields of infectious diseases and human genomics. He's the director of the Precision Medicine Unit at the CHUV and associate professor at EPFL. Professor Fellet is also group leader of the Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics and co-director of the Health 2030 Genome Center at Campus Biotech in Geneva. He's a member of the Swiss National COVID-19 Swiss Science Task Force and currently conducts a research project on human genomics for severe forms of COVID-19 that he will present today. Thank you very much, Jack, for joining. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to be with you tonight and to, to tell a few words about the research we do in human genetics. But first, I will spend two minutes to set the stage on where we are with COVID because I'm in this COVID National Science Task Force where we have the mission to basically lay the scientific facts for the deciders, for the politics to make the decision they have to make. And um, it's an interesting exercise, let's say, not always um, uh, extremely gratifying because obviously there are other, um, the other reason why decisions are made, not pure science as we sometimes would like it. So right now in Switzerland, we went down the second wave uh, somehow. And I compare here Switzerland to United States and European Union to show that we were in a really extremely bad spot a few weeks ago. We went down a bit, but we are still at very high levels if we compare it to the first wave. And even more so if you look at the number of deaths per million people, we are among the worst in the world and we are stabilizing at high level, which is, which is bad. So that's the diagnosis right now. So what does it mean? In the next days and weeks, we have one way or another to regain control. Uh, because if you look at the recent days, since seven, 10 days, we are again in a bad situation because the case and death numbers are plateauing at relatively high levels. Uh, we have the reproduction number of the virus, its famous RE, that is again above one 
on average in Switzerland, even though the West part of Switzerland this time does better because we had stronger measures, at least until later this week. Uh, but if you look at uh, hospital occupation and ICU beds, especially, we are still at worryingly high levels. And th this in green is the curves from the SHU, where you see that we are at a stable level, much higher than the peak of the first wave, about more than 250 hospitalized patients at the SHU. Uh, yeah, as of yesterday. Uh, so we need new measures and we need new measures just to go through the winter season. And uh, the following months we'll have to, we will have to hold the line and hold the line until hopefully the vaccines deliver and that won't be before the spring. So we have to maintain what we call an epidemic break, a combination of measures that allows us not to overwhelm the health system and to stabilize the epidemics, it means not to increase the number of cases. And the best way to do it is at very low numbers, because otherwise we have people dying and suffering uh, uselessly, because we have to apply the same measures to be stable at 5,000 cases a day or at 100 cases a day, as soon as we reach that level. And that's an important point. So now let me go to the research we actually do in my lab at EPFL on COVID-19. So I'm devoted my research to human genomics of infectious diseases. And uh, we used the tools we developed for other pathogens to um, tackle this one. And an interesting feature of this epidemic is obviously the discrepancies in clinical outcome between people. And you all know that being old and having comorbidities are the main risk factors to have a severe disease or to die from COVID-19. But there are always exceptions. And what we like to do is to learn from those exceptions. And here on the figure, you can see uh, that in red are the severe cases. Uh, and in most cases, those are in the elderly and in the comorbid patients. But there are people that are young, no known comorbidities, and they end up in ICU or dead because of SARS-CoV-2 infection. And we are basically studying those people screening their genomes to try and understand why they end up be having severe preclinical presentation. So we recruited so far about 100 patients in ICU in Italy and, and Switzerland. And we are part of a large international consortium studying those extreme cases. Um, we sequenced the full genome of the patients and we analyze them using standard pipelines that we developed for that purpose. And what we found in the preliminary analysis were really very interesting deficiencies in the cascade that leads to the activation of interference. And infer interference are the first line of defense against viruses we have. So it's basically the alarm system in our cells that recognize an incoming danger, an incoming virus, and the interferon will basically activate the immunity to fight. And in up to 14% of the patients we analyzed, we find a reason in the genome or in the antibodies that were generated in those patients that made this interferon response defective. And this is interesting first because we explain part of the clinical presentation. We could diagnose people when they arrive with a genetic test, whether they are at high risk of developing complications. And there are immediate translational applications like interferon by a nasal application that exists and are now tried in clinical trials for those patients. And we could also use plasmapheresis, which is a way to replace part of the blood of the patients um, to remove those autoantibodies against interferon. And altogether, it means that from the moment we have the DNA to the moment we can possibly do something for patients, it's only a, a matter of a, of a few months. So in conclusion, this kind of study, uh, it's using human genetic diversity as an experiment of nature, no need for a model, no need for cells, no need for mice. We use human gen genetic diversity and we can better understand host viral interaction and possibly identify new therapeutic or vaccinal targets. And with that, I give the word back to Leila and thank you for your attention. Many thanks, uh, Jacques. This is really fascinating and we look forward to the round table to learn more about it. Uh, I will now um, pass on the stage to um, Professor Carmela Troncoso.
She, ha she heads actually the Security and Privacy Engineering Laboratory at the Faculty of Computer Science and Communications. Carmela has actively participated in the development of the Swiss COVID application for contact tracing. So her work and leadership on the development of the DP3T protocol has been recognized. And in 2020, Carmela has joined the ranks of the Fortune 40 under 40 from the Fortune magazine. And uh, she's also a member of the Swiss National COVID-19 Science Task Force. So please, Carmela. Thank you, Leila. And um, thank you for putting me on the English side of the event. My French is not really the strongest. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the work that my lab and, and a full team of researchers at DPFL and beyond have been doing in the last six months. And our work started back in March after the beginning of the pandemic. And since then has been continuing, um, we used to call this a sprint. Lately, Marcel Salate calls it the Iron Man and, and it's unclear um, when, when we're gonna stop needing technology in, and developing new things to support pandemic mitigation measures. And indeed how I got here is because um, a, a main tool to help with the spread of diseases is what is called contact tracing. In contact tracing, uh, you have people that have the disease and then uh, doctors ask them who are their contacts and then talk to these contacts to tell them to take precautions. The speed of growth of COVID-19 rendered this process uh, useless, like overwhelmed. Contact tracers cannot do interviews, they cannot call, and at some point, people turned to technology to see if we could help. And that was the need for a complement that would help doctors reach faster and in a more efficient way without the need of so much um, human intervention. Those that have been close to uh, COVID positive patients and therefore are at risk of being infected and can spread the infection. The goal is to tell them early enough to take precautions, to take a test, to uh, get into quarantine so that we can stop uh, the growth of the virus and the graphs that Jack Desoas can, can go down again, both uh, in the number of cases, but also in the number of um, beds, easier hospitals, that we can kind of recover the health of our health system. And this is a great, uh, it's a great goal, but now we're asking ourselves to ask the whole population to put new technology in their pockets. New technology that was to be designed in, in not something that is agile. Agile was slow for what we did. We brought the product from inception to the market in three months. And we did not only ask the Swiss people to use this product, but all Europe and effectively all the world. It was something to be used by millions of users, billions of users. And at that point, when we are thinking about putting technology, what is important is to reflect and think Technology can solve problems, but it must not become a new problem. Otherwise, we have done nothing. And when we put a technology that in principle could be as invasive as the one that we're putting on, what we sat down and thought is we need to make sure that this technology cannot be used for anything that is not helping with this pandemic. We wanted to build technology that limits the use, the purpose, by default, technologically. And with this, the women hide a lot of information so they cannot be used for something else. And we know that the information that is mostly valuable and can be used for other things are who are the users in the system, which is their location, and when do they go to places. We know that this encodes a lot of information about ourselves, where we live, where we work, what we like, and also our social behavior, who we meet, how often do we meet them, how much time do we spend with them, and so forth. And of course, we needed a system that also was secure in the sense that would not give false alarms. If you receive a notification, it is really because you have someone by your side that has a COVID-19 and that cannot be easily denied of service because if we put a lot of technology out there, but it doesn't work and we just didn't win much, we just run a risk for nothing. And with this, we came up with this protocol, a term DP3T, uh, which for those who know that doesn't know how it works, let me go very fast. Your phone creates a key and which this creates a series of random codes. 
Random here means that looking at the codes, you cannot know from which phone they come from. And if you look at two different codes, you don't know if they come from the same phone or not. As people walk around uh, broadcasting these codes, others listen to them and record them in their phone, together with some information about the power of the signal that you can imagine acts as a proxy for distance. When somebody is positive, they upload to the server the codes that they have been broadcasting. And this is the key decision from a privacy perspective, because the only information that ever leaves the phone to the server is information, is random numbers that do not depend on the identity of the user. They only depend on the key that your phone has generated. They do not depend on the location of the user because they are created according to a predefined schedule. And therefore they don't say, they don't depend on where you are and when you are there. And it does not have any information about others. It doesn't matter how many people you met, how often you went with there, how many numbers they recorded, because the only thing that you will upload is what you produced. And that means that this server has no information that they can abuse to use for anything else than notification. And how does notification happen? The rest of the phones go to the server and download these numbers. Then they check internally, have I ever seen these numbers? And for all of the numbers they have seen, they take this other number that is a proxy for distance and they make a global computation. And if this computation says that they have been for long enough, close enough to COVID positive people, then they receive this notification. Another key consideration when we designed this system is that we didn't want to create something that would stay forever. We are creating a technology for an emergency and it's important that it's only here to help us with the emergency. In this system, the system of the system depends on people, A, having the app, and B, uploading codes. It doesn't matter what the government decides to do if they decide to have the server forever or the app forever on the App Store. As long as users stop using it, as long as users do not consent to upload, the system just disappears. So the power relies on the people and not on the government. And it is these properties which led Google and Apple to take this protocol and embed it, which is nowadays called Exposure Notification API, which is underlying all of the contact tracing apps uh, that we have uh, in the world. Um, these apps here are the ones that follow this protocol. And this is the first truly privacy by design product that is developed at the larger scale, I mean, across the world. And of them, these six countries here are the ones that use currently our code base that not only uses this protocol, but also has other extra mechanisms that improve the privacy of the system and make sure that once you embed the protocol in an app, and this is embedded uh, on a larger system with the cloud and with the health system, you still conserve all of the properties that we design on the product. And this was an external journey, but with a lot of lessons. The first one that to me is the most important is that we have demonstrated that data is not a must when we talk about technology. We're always told data is the new oil, but data is not always what is needed. When we have a problem, there are many other ways of solving it that actually do not incur the risk. And as Martin was saying before, allows us to preserve democracy, which is the thing that we should not cherish and we should not let leave just because we are in an emergency situation. Second lesson for me is that privacy engineering is thing that when I did in the lab on papers, well, it's, it's exhausting and like doing research is not, it's not kind of a, a vacation, but actually doing it for real in an agile world where things change all the time, where we depend on service like the Google and Apple API is exhausting. And the third one is that it's not only about the technology. There is a lot of work uh, to integrate this technology in the health system. And if we don't do this and we don't work hard and we have worked only myself, uh, but Professor Bunyong and others that have helped us um, talk with doctors, talk with uh, BAG to really embed all of this technological process and be able to make it help and stop uh, infection chains. And with this, I'm gonna stop and give the uh, word back to Leila and I'll be happy to answer questions in the round table and beyond. Many thanks, Carmela. This was fascinating and uh, am amazing success uh, with this protocol. So I would like now to uh, invite on stage Professor Stilacci, Francesco Stilacci. He's a material scientist and engineering expert. He's direct the director of the Laboratory of Supramolecular Nanomaterials and Interfaces, the Sun Mill at EPFL, that he joined in 2010 after the MIT.
Francesco is the recipient of numerous science and innovation prizes, such as the Technology Review um, TR35 Prize or the Brilliant 10 Prize of the Popular Science Magazines. He currently works on developing a broad spectrum antiviral drug with the hope of making progress in the fight against SARS-CoV-2 in particular, but not only. And he received in 2020 a significant grant from the Werner Science Siemens Foundation to support his work that he will present to us tonight. So many thanks, Francesco. Thank you very much for having me here. It's an honor to speak to all of these uh, alumni, but it's always hard to follow Jacques and uh, Carmela. Um, my talk will uh, be uh, uh, a lot less uh, practical and applied than uh, the previous two. Uh, and it will uh, be centered uh, a lot on um, a major thrust in my laboratory. And that thrust can start from uh, a very hard question that I could pose to the society around me is what of what is happening in these days could have not been predicted? And unfortunately, the answer is very little. In fact, uh, 10 years ago, when I joined uh, EPFL from MIT as a material scientist, I was asked in my interview what new project I wanted to start coming to Switzerland, given that EPFL allows you this great flexibility in uh, uh, terms of funding and allows you to have your own research lines. And I replied to stand, a stand group of material scientists that I wanted to work in antivirals. And I felt that there was an urgency of doing so, exactly as in these days I share Martin's uh, view in the last slide that there is an urgency of working on climate change on a global scale in a broad way. But, well, back then I felt we actually need to be getting ourselves ready for a possibility of a pandemic um, threat. Why is that? If you look at this slide on this uh, left part here, that's the list of viruses that have emerged or re-emerged starting roughly 1970. Most of the people online, uh, like me, would have uh, been born before AIDS came. Uh, and uh, emerged. I, I do remember vividly when it emerged, the news and everything. And yet, once the uh, AIDS situation calmed down, we didn't ask ourselves whether there would have been a next virus, which there was. Some names are, are known to you, like Ebola or Zika. And uh, when MERS or SARS, which are on this slide, which I've been using for the last 10 years, uh, when they arrived, you know, we didn't ask ourselves whether another coronavirus would arrive. But we knew that uh, new viruses can hit in very, very hard ways. In this slide, in this part of this slide here, I show um, the incidence that the Spanish flu had on life expectancy in the US. This is the dip due to sp the Spanish flu. For you to know the broad peak here and the broad deep here, they are World War I and II respectively. I don't think coronavirus will end up um, being very visible in lifetime expectancy plot. But if we, uh, in the future, when we will plot the gross products of nations, so economic uh, indicators, 2020 will be forever visible because of coronavirus. So now we know that a virus emerging can actually have devastating effect on health and the economy. Um, and this slide here shows that corona will not be the last one. There will be others. Rough, there has been a new virus emerging roughly every four years since the 70s. How do we fight an emerging virus? We've learned, all of us in this pandemic, that we have to wait for a vaccine and that can take a year. In future, I hope we will do research in way of speeding up the process of vaccine development and it will never be less than six, nine months. My personal answer is that it would be beneficial to have broad spectrum antivirals exactly as in the fight against bacteria, we have broad spectrum antibiotics can actually we develop broad spectrum antivirals that are ready there when a new virus arrives. It turns out that it 
the first publication on this uh, uh, topic that I could find dates 1947. And basically the bulk of a publication that really hit the nail on the coffin is from the 60s. What these people discovered is that all most most viruses will actually all target the same sugars on the cell membranes. And if you were to imitate these sugars, what you can do is to generate compounds that bind to viruses as sugars on cell membranes would do, and by binding, prevent the entry of a virus inside a cell. The problem with this approach and the reason for why starting from the 60s to now in 60 years, it has not made much progress from the first publication. It's based on a very basic common knowledge that I hope a lot of the alumni have learned at DPFL when they study chemistry. And that is that binding is always a reversible event. If you bind to something, you do it above a certain concentration, below you unbind. So what happens below that concentration is that you release a perfectly infective virus then restarts the infection mechanism. And so none of these drugs actually made it past phase three clinical trials because upon dilution in the body, they would lose efficacy. So here I came as a material scientist and asked myself, can I make a reversible effect irreversible? So can I actually add an arrow to this scheme? In material science, this is a common knowledge that you can do that. It happens every time in corrosion. Can I do the same to a virus? My idea, I will explain with a short movie here. Um, what you see here, is you see a molecule that will bind to a virus exactly like the publication from the 60s, but upon binding, it will actually adhere so strongly to a prior pressure. And that pressure repeated for symmetry throughout the virus ends up being a devastating force that actually is able to break the virus. And breaking the virus is an irreversible event. Now, We've been working a lot in these days to push this concept towards the clinic. I will show you here some data that will appear in the next few days online. And they are data produced at NIH in the US um, over one of our molecules against the last pandemic form of influenza, which happens in 2009. So it's called California 09. And what you see here is a survival curve. So every time you see these dots here is because our mice in the test died. This is a pandemic form of influenza, so it killed the whole population of mice in nine days. When we gave uh, to these mice Tamiflu, 24 hours post-infection, Tamiflu uh, scientific name Oseltamivir is the best drug we have against influenza. And in humans, it's known to have a very short window of efficacy. It works only for the first three, 36 hours from infection, not from symptoms. That's a problem. Now, what you can see here is that Tamiflu only lengthened the lifespan of a day and a half of in our mice, but didn't do much more than that. Our compound saved 90% of a population of a mice. So kept a large, uh, for a large time, a lot of efficacy. We hope to be able to do that with very broad spectrum drugs that can work on Corona, but can work most importantly on the future pandemic viruses. I'll stop here thanking my group, thanking the very generous foundation of the Vernon Siemens Foundation that really has made all of this possible. And that foundation, that foundation gift came because of a very fast uh, response of EPFL. And I'll pass the word back to, to you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Francesco. So, um, so now we are going to, I will introduce uh, Mirko bischof Berger, the head of communication at EPFL, for a few questions to our, uh, our panelists and, uh, and Q&A as well. So if you have questions, please enter them in the Q&A or just vote for the ones that are already there so that we can take them. Thank you. So... Hello, thanks a lot, Leila. Thanks, Jacques, thanks, Carmela, thanks, Francesco, for your wonderful talks. So we won't have too much time because we only have until six. So I will maybe start with a question to each one of you. 
and then take questions from the audience. And uh, I would still, even if it's only a few questions, like to try to go the path of uh, talking a bit about the application, about data, maybe starting with you, Carmela, then moving from data into policy, maybe asking you something about uh, your role in the task force, Jacques, and finally coming to the vaccine development uh, to you, Francesco. So Francesca, so uh, sorry, Carmela, <laughs> the question I would like to ask you is, uh, in, you, you showed that you started in March in 2020, but how did the idea come along of, of this uh, protocol behind the DP3T? And uh, what, is, what, what about other solutions are around in the world? Which countries use what? Where are we standing? So um, and this, this came to us. Uh, uh, we were invited to participate as part of a European pan-European initiative to create this kind of applications. And the idea was that we didn't want to replicate the very, very invasive Asian methods of everybody has all of the location monitored all the time. And then there was this idea of using Bluetooth in a particular protocol. And me and my colleagues observed that that protocol really did not solve the kind of problem that is the abuse of power at the end of the day. Sure, we would have some identifiers, but did, that didn't really mean that the system could not be abused for uh, anything else. There was actually a lot of potential for abuse and discrimination embedded in that particular application. So that's when we proposed a different protocol and we made a big effort to communicate to the world that this was a very important decision for everyone. We, taking this discussion to many parliaments across Europe and, and across the world. Uh, currently, most of the Western nations have their apps based on the Google and Apple uh, exposure notification, which follows our protocol. Other countries, especially in Asia, still have uh, less uh, privacy preserving and democratic options. Thanks a lot. And then maybe I'll move to you, Jacques. So talking about uh, personal data protection, penetration, policy, you're in the task force and you, in, in your talk, you said uh, the situation is quite bad epidemiologically, but I guess in general, the task force uh, was accompanying politics. And so uh, I guess my question is, to what extent did the policy not hear enough the scientific message on, on prospects, on, 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 on the statistics, but maybe also on, on the need of an application in the beginning? So in the beginning is, is an important point. Uh, we had to force the door. So that's a point that, uh, I mean, we are not in the best position to make the diagnosis ourselves, but it's true that in the very early weeks of the, of the crisis, uh, there was no opportunity, no uh, ch channels to really, as scientists or biomedical researcher or, or doctors, because I'm, a, I'm an MD as well, to talk to the politicians. So we were uh, panicked almost, something terrible was arriving and nobody seemed to realize it. So that's why we started having some uh, agitation in the media and it was not very well perceived at the political level, I have to say. Then it was organized into the scientific task force. And from that moment on, it wasn't always harmonious, but at least there was an official way for scientists to gather the information, digest it and give it back to the people that have to finally make the decision. So it's always easier to be in our shoes than in theirs because we give them what we think is uh, momentan momentarily truth, but they then need to make decisions that have an impact on people's life. Uh, so the frustration on our side is not to be followed when we tell them, look, it's August, we see the numbers increasing. There is an exponential growth in this, in this country. If we don't do anything, we'll have a catastrophic situation in October. And sure enough, in October, it went up, not that quickly after all. It was the continuation of the, of the summer. But at the same time, hey, who, who would have been ready in, in August to close down the country? And uh, population was against. Majority of the Bundesrat, uh, the Conseil Federal was against, so there was no way. So it's an interesting learning process for scientists as well to be confronted to real life decisions. It shouldn't discourage us from bringing the science wherever it needs to be heard, and then at least to have the elements to make informed decisions. Thank you. And what about the, the, the deployment of the app? It also needed some parliamentarians' decisions and had the task force a role and could it, uh, was it heard? So Carmela, it would be better placed than me because she is in the, in the digital okay. epidemiology group of the task force. So I let her talk about that, I guess. There was a lot of 
Yeah, recommendation and again information from the task force so that the Swiss Parliament could do an informed decision. Also, with respect of the different options, I think the Jack has said it right. Our role is to communicate and to expose a lot of things that are very difficult to grasp uh, many times when you are at a higher level and show the details so that good decisions uh, can be made. And indeed, the task force uh, produced a lot of documentation and, and information for parliamentarians to decide how and why um, accept this application and also define the good legal framework in which this application is to, is to exist. Thank you. I'm coming to you, Francesco. Maybe to talk about exactly uh, broadband antivirals and uh, in general drugs, and but also vaccines. So the, the development of science as a, as, a, as a cure, let's say, or the prevention. Uh, I guess my question goes in the direction of scientific rigorosity because everything goes in a rush now, and there has been also a rumor about remdesivir, other drugs by Gilead. So to what extent is in this speed uh, scientific rigorosity still uh, held? Look, um, I've been asked this question many times. Uh, the question is people are dying and are dying uh, in uh, incredible numbers. Uh, you've seen uh, Jacques and uh, Jacques plots. And so I don't think that in academic setting, rigor has not been respected. And I cannot think of a single example of an academic institution that has come up with um, uh, false news. On the other hand, companies that uh, were quoted and had stocks and things like that uh, were forced to uh, release preliminary data. To the best of my knowledge, because I've been asked to uh, comment on them many times, let's say the case of remdesivir, uh, people released preliminary data as such, saying they were preliminary. Maybe only the hydroxyskinin case, it's kind of uh, muddy. Um, but then uh, people were dying. So what do you do? You take the preliminary data, and as exactly as Jack said, uh, with the data you have at hand, you make the best possible decision. Now, things like remdesivir have not uh, shown to be uh, to have efficacy, as like adoxyclinin. But as I've tried to say, we were completely scientifically unprepared. It's not that we had many other antiviral to try. And uh, same thing with vaccines. Uh, we've gone at uh, incredibly high speed to develop them. Uh, of the three that now seem to be approved, there's a fourth one, which is uh, the Cancino one, the Chinese one, that is de facto approved, but uh, not very popular in the Western world. But um, these four, um, two of them, the AstraZeneca and the CanSino one, um, are basic classic vaccines. And so you don't expect much. The other two, Moderna and Pfizer, are uh, the first time where you, humanity will have mRNA as a vaccine. Uh, hopefully everything will go well. I'm very optimistic it will go well. And that can change the landscape for vaccines uh, forever. Thanks a lot, it's very interesting. I'm taking the questions now from the Q&A, so please uh, continue to pose your questions and, and even more important, rate and vote. There's a little like button, so I try to take those that are the one most pressing given time. So there's a question, uh, is there any comparison between the COVID statistics and the seasonal flu one? I guess that goes to you, Jacques. Uh, yes, this is not the flu. Um, the, the, the answer is not that straightforward because you need to, to know what you compare. But if we speak about a population that is structured like the Swiss population, with the same percentage of old people, of comorbid people, uh, this COVID kills 0.5%. So one out of 200 people dies. Uh, with flu, if you imagine that there is no vaccination, it's 10 times less than that. And now we have the full population susceptible here and large part of the of the at-risk population is protected by the vaccine for the flu, meaning that at the end of the day, we have, if we let the both epidemics go through the population, we'll end up with about 50,000 deaths from COVID and about two, 3,000 from flu. So it's at least 10 times more deadly than flu in whatever uh, scenario you imagine. Thank you. The next most rated question is uh, coming also back to what friend Marty said, the living with the insecurity. So the introduction of vaccines and, is all, and other things is linked to political issues. And uh, so on the other hand, some people are opposed to vaccines. So at the beginning, some governments, such as the Swiss one, denied the usefulness of masks. 
when some people started to be confused or unconvinced. So the question is, where is it possible to find neutral and useful information on vaccines now? Maybe for you then, Francesco. That's a tough question because uh, in this world of over-information, it's very difficult to navigate over-information. In fact, I was going to think you would revert the question to Carmela because the, <laughs> there's, uh, the, the, we are bombarded by news. Um, the, I, I, the only thing I can say is that the uh, role of uh, EPA, of the FDA, and uh, you've seen that England has acted first, is to neutrally evaluate the safety and efficacy data and come up with a decision. After that, of course, uh, vaccination would be voluntary. Uh, but uh, for what my competence are, I have the data I could see, I didn't see anything that uh, is worrying in terms of safety of a vaccine. Okay, we all know these vaccines uh, uh, need to be taken two times. Apparently, the mRNA vaccines the second time will give you some fever and headaches, and that's it. Uh, for now. Thank you. Next question is for you, Carmela. From observations from friends who got infected, there was a delay of two to three days between being informed by medical authorities of a positive test and receiving a code to enter the into Swiss COVID, potentially losing valuable time preventing further contagions. Is this a case of the human factor implementation limitation in a beautifully designed algorithm? I don't think this is a case of a human uh, it is much bigger than that. As I said before, it was the integration of the health system, and that means that there needs a lot, there need to be a lot of pieces for this to work. We actually do know that when when this this cycle works well, when actually the code is is given immediately, the app has quite success at at stopping infections. Now it is true that uh, especially as doctors get clog, especially as the next wave arrive, and we're in the case, as Jacques was saying before, where everything collapses, then doctors also don't have the time to get the code. The code does not arrive. Where exactly all of these things uh, happen is very hard to know for us. Um, we're working with, with cantonal doctors, with also uh, Federation, in trying to improve and find out which are the bottlenecks. But I wouldn't say that it's only the human factor. It's, it's really like Systems, systems are complex, and the health system is the most complex of all. Thank you. The next one is for you, Jacques, the, the million dollar question. There is still no good explanation of why Switzerland has been doing so poorly. Usually we are quite disciplined. Yeah, it's a, it's a mix of uh, bad luck because we were close to Italy for the start of the first wave. Um, democracy, uh, distributed democracy, I would say. Um, and uh, a little bit of arrogance, that's my diagnosis. I think the factor, the, the federalism here, we cannot avoid uh, mentioning it because uh, in a situation where you need to respond to a crisis, you need a general usually. And here we have the possibility that is part of the foundation of the country to dilute responsibility and to let others act and, and make the difficult decisions. And by design, it's a failure in such a circ circumstances because we'll always be too late at the time we make a decision. And there we are back to what Martin Vettel said, exponential. And ex politicians don't get what is an exponential growth. And, they were the, and, and that's what we are basically said by authorities Look, it's increasing, we see it, but as, as long as the hospitals are not close to being full, we won't be able to do anything because population would not understand it. And uh, because we're in a democracy, they listen to the population that doesn't understand exponentials. And that's why, paradoxically, the democratic advantage here turns into something uh, difficult to, to manage this pandemic. Thank you. I see that we have Martin joining us. Welcome. So maybe I can pose you a question too. What impact does the lockdown have, the first one, on the students? Well, that's a tough question. Um, I think it's a little bit like it was fun the first few weeks, then it was very long, and then we didn't see the end of it. I think the first semester where we went online, I think within 72 hours, uh, everybody, you know, sort of was gun ho we are going to succeed, uh, we are going to put all these courses online, and I think it was very well done. I would like to thank professors and their assistants to have done a tremendous job 
of moving all of EPFL teaching online very quickly. Uh, I would like to commend the students who played along, you know, and the, the success of the exams actually in August proved that uh, it worked pretty well. Um, that's for the first wave in the spring. And uh, for the fall semester, we tried very hard to keep the campus open. And then, as Jacques said, um, maybe not for the protocol, but our authorities didn't really take the second wave very seriously. Uh, we tried to keep the first year students on campus in a rotation basis, but then actually uh, political authorities asked us to close down all of the teaching activity. I think this is a difficult period for our students, especially the first year students, the ones that had shown up, you know, mid-September for the first time on campus, not having a strong social network or already built up and going into this uh, sort of pseudo lockdown was certainly not fun. So we have, we, when I say we, it's collectively, it's a community at EPFL, which includes student organizations, professors, assistants, and so on, have tried to counteract this with a lot of nice and, and creative initiatives, uh, systems with, uh, you know, parrainage between students of upper classes with first year students and so on. So we are trying our best and I think it's going okay, but I have to say it's a, it's a, it's a big challenge. It's a big challenge for the students. Thanks a lot. Maybe I'll get back to you, Carmela. There is a lot of talking also about questions talking about the acceptance of the technology, which was a good technology. And I guess also about the different roles that you and, and we had in developing to versus the role of the state. You developed this for the state, which had the role of communicating it. So where, how do you assess this? Uh, where, why is the acceptance not as high or maybe this high in your, from your perspective? So I think a lot of the acceptance problem is communication, 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 and communication, right? How to how to explain to people how it works, why it works. One of the things that also made it very hard is communications is the fact that we had history against us. We have the last 10 years of very data hungry and surveillance hungry kind of apps. And people do not believe. In fact, if you look at surveys, the main two reasons why people do not install risk of it uh, number one is because they don't believe in the pandemic. I don't think we can ever get those users. If they don't believe the pandemic is here, we cannot do anything. But the second one is actually this is a surveillance tool. And I think communication can do wonders in this, in this sense about how it works. Um, I do explain a lot of how we designed this in my computer security course in the bachelor. And then at the end of this class, the next day, I had a couple of students that came to me that says, after the class and after understanding, now they go around recommending all of the family and friends to install the app because now we fully believe this thing. So it's a lot about uh, helping people to understand. And on that sense, our role was a lot of that at EPFL, doing the communication and trying to explain how it works. Now there is so much reach that we have and there is other communication that should come from mm -hmm. other places that maybe didn't happen as much as it could have been desired. Thank you. I think we're running out of time and we have to close this round. Maybe Francesco, just a very quick one, because you showed this graph about the evolution, about the evolution timeline, the last hundred years. So how much time do we have until the next virus hits or, or it mutates? Or no, the, the next, to answer. So the, the next virus on average is one every four years. So considering COVID has lasted uh, one year or maybe more, huh? three years. The, the, whether the next one will be pandemic, uh, we hopefully not. I mean, we. Uh, I hope we get a break. Uh, maybe 20 years, 30 years. Uh, it's like a Russian roulette. We don't know. Um, the fact that viruses emerge depends on the distance, average temporal and spatial distance between people and people and animal. And as you know, the, the curve of uh, population growth, pre, uh, we are uh, 8 billion now, 2050 will be 11 billion. And uh, these people eat chicken, they eat uh, beef and so on and so forth. So we will have more chickens, more beef uh, and so on and so forth. So all of this tells us that the average time in between viruses shortens. Now, how pandemic these viruses are, as I said, hopefully, you know, we get a break. Perfect. Thanks a lot. I thank you all, Jacques, Carmela, Francesco, Martin, for this roundtable and questions. And I give the word back to Leila.
Excellent. So I just want to say a big, big thank you. We're getting to the end. So I want to thank actually our participants for joining us. So we had 250 alumni connected tonight. I mean, even more, 260. So that's great. Thanks a lot for, for being here and for your active questions and answers. And then also, I would like to thank, of course, all our speakers and, uh, and uh, our president for, for joining and Mirko for moderating. So I wish you all some très, très bonne fête de fin d'année. Et, uh, et on espère vous revoir tous en vrai très bientôt en 2021. Merci. Au revoir. Bonne soirée. Bonne soirée. Bonne soirée. Bonne soirée. Au revoir. Bonne fête.